please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 57. prophet Isaiah, given a vision by God of days in the future that would come when the people of God would be taken away in exile. And here he gives them some word of hope. Beginning with verse 14. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of life that I made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him, I hid my face and was angry, but he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of his lips. Peace, peace, to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Thus far, the Old Testament reading. Please turn now to Ephesians chapter 2 where we will begin our reading with verse 13. This too is God's word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Oh Lord our God, we do look to you this morning and ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to work in our heart, that we would have access to the Father because of all that Christ has done. We pray that you would open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts today, that we would see Jesus more clearly, that you would open our ears, that we would hear what he 
wants us to hear, what we need to hear. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems that our world is growing increasingly hostile and divided. Tempers are flaring. Violence is escalating. And the tension is sliding from the broader culture even into the church. Are you for Trump or are you against him? Are you for Biden or are you against him? What about guns? What about immigration? What about Black Lives Matter? What about police? What about COVID vaccines? What about the masks that you're wearing right now? Do you do it because you want to or are you doing it under protest? All these different questions, all these different conflicts in the world around and they're sliding into the church as well. Now I believe almost everyone can agree on this, that the isolation during the pandemic has been very difficult. And we all look forward to it coming to an end. But on the issues, and on those who propose answers to the issues, people are still quite divided, except perhaps in their weariness from all fighting. How do we find peace? How? Do we find peace? And where is the church in all of this conflict? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus and the churches in the surrounding regions out of concern for the church. He had planted the church originally, and it in turn had planted other churches that grew out of those that were planted by him. But now he was in prison because of his faith, and he could not go and visit them as was his pattern. Generally, he would go around planting churches, and then he would return and visit them again, and then he would return and visit them again. We know of three journeys that he made visiting the churches. And because he could not visit, he wrote this letter. And in this letter, in our text this morning in particular, he addresses the peace and the unity of the church. The world knows violence, hostility, and hatred. Where is the world going to learn of peace, real peace? Where will the world see unity and humility? If not in the church, they will not see it anywhere. Now, he does not propose specific programs for peace, but he does set forth the crucial foundation on which alone peace, real peace, can truly be built. And that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. In our text, Christ is specifically referenced six times. He is the subject of every verb found in verses 14 through 17. The word peace is found four times. The word both or two occurs four times. The word one occurs four times. Hostility occurs twice. There's an emphasis on both, the two, the divided. There's also an emphasis on one and unity. There's an emphasis on Christ, beginning and end. There's an emphasis on peace. It begins by referring to those who are far and those who are near. It ends 
referring to those who are far and those who are near. And in this weaving of these different themes, we come to see that Jesus is the cause of Christian unity and peace. It is Christ who brings unity between people. In verse 14, Paul says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There is a very emphatic himself. He himself, Christ himself, is our peace. You see, it's not just that he brings peace. It's not that he causes it to happen. It is that he himself, in his person, is our peace. Our hope for peace does not rest in more classes on diversity training. It does not depend on government-funded programs to force us to be nice to one another. Our hope for peace rests in the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, in him, being joined to him, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And what, do, what does the Old Testament tell us about Jesus? The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 9, you will remember when he declares that to us a son will be born that a son is given who will be the savior of the people. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And he goes on to say of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. When the angels declared his birth to the shepherds, what did they say? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. Peace is the word that was given. The prophet Micah in Micah 5, 5, in speaking of the Savior who was to come. It says in verse 4, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. It's very interesting that in the biblical world, when we think about what was the great cause of division and hostility in the biblical world, it was not race. It was not race. It was religion. Either you were a Jew or you weren't a Jew. Either you were in covenant with God through the covenants made to Abraham and to Moses and to David, or you were outside the covenant. That's what the reference here to those being near and those being far is referring to. In the biblical world, those who were far off were the Gentiles, and those who were near were the Jews, God's own people. The Jews were the ones who were near to God. So, for example, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 7,
we read, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? God is near to us. That means that we are now near to God. In Psalm 148, verse 14, we see similarly, God has raised up a horn for his people, praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. It is God's people, his chosen people, people that he called for through Abraham, who were to be a blessing to all the world, but whom he separated out from the world to be near to him. They were the ones who were near. It was the world, the Gentiles, the non-Jews that were far off. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, we read, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It was a nation from far away that would come against them, that would stand against them. Similarly, in Deuteronomy 29, verse 22, we read, and the next generation, your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land will say when they see the afflictions of that land and the sicknesses with which the Lord has made it sick. There's a distinction between God's people and the foreigners from a far land. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, it is... The Gentiles who are referred to as far off. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. The Messiah calls to the people who are far off, the nations. From afar, also in Jeremiah, we see this same pattern in Jeremiah 5, verse 15. Behold, I am bringing against you a nation from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. In the biblical world, the, the division was not race. The division was, were you in covenant with God or weren't you? Were you near to God or were you far away? When Paul, in other places, appeals to the fact that there are to be no divisions in the church, listen to what he says. Galatians 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Nothing in there about race. It's about the fact of life, are you male or female? Are you in covenant with God or are you not? Are you Jew or are you Gentile? Or are you slave or free, subject to the economic conditions, which can create a great division between people? But there's nothing here said of race. Similarly, in Colossians 3, verse 11. We read here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now this is not to say that race is not a serious problem in our day, nor to say that it is not a part of the cause of much division. 
It's rather to emphasize the fact that it's to our shame that race has become that major division when in the biblical worldview, the issue was, are you in covenant with God or are you not? Are you near to God or are you not? What matters, Paul says here, is are you joined to Christ by faith? Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are far off have been brought near. That's what matters. Are you in Christ? Have you been brought near to God? By putting your trust in him. Now, why is putting your trust in Christ bring you near to God? Well, because he goes on to say, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's by what Christ has done in going to the cross, in bearing the sins of sinners against God. That's what brings you near. It's Christ who brings you near. It is your relationship to Christ that secures you to God. And notice what he goes on to say in verse 14. How is it that Christ, in going to the cross, has brought us near to God? Why is it Christ to whom we must look as the foundation for any peace? Well, it says in verse 14, He himself is our peace, who has made us both one. The both there referring to the near and the far, the Jew and the Gentile. It is Christ alone who could bridge that divide and make us one. There were Jewish believers, there were Gentile believers in the church that ought not be a reason for division. He says Christ himself has made the both one. And in conjunction with that, he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The hostility that existed between the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew looking to the Gentile and saying, you're not in the covenant, you're not one of us. The Gentile with their snide remarks about these inferior people, the Jews, the such a small and tiny people, who do they think they were? And it says that it is Christ who broke down the wall of hostility. Now, what is that wall of hostility? Some think, oh, well, in the temple, there was a wall that divided where the Jews could go and where the Gentiles could go. And the Gentiles were, were far out in the nosebleed section. They, so far away, they could really not see what was going on. But you see... It makes a nice illustration, but it's unlikely that the Gentiles in Ephesus, in the church there, knew about the temple and uh, knew about that wall. No, the wall is what he goes on to say by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. You see, it was the law that created the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The Jews were circumcised as part of the covenant. The Gentiles would not be circumcised. The Jews had rituals that they were to perform, festivals. And the Gentiles did not have to do those things. It was a major point of contention whether the Gentiles needed to do those things. You'll remember in Acts 15, there was a, a church council that they had a call together because the church was dividing over this very issue. Did the Gentiles need to become Jews in order to be Christians? And the answer was no. Christ, who was the focus of those laws, did away with their significance when he died on the cross so that salvation in relation to God is no longer a matter of following certain rituals. 
Instead, it is putting your trust in Christ as the one who died for your sinfulness and your failure to keep the law. He is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. The ancient preacher Chrysostom says this Reference to the making of one new man out of the two would be if you took a lead statue of a person and a silver statue of the person and you melted them both down and now you have a gold statue, one gold statue, one new man, something totally new. Totally new as far as the world is concerned. A world that saw only difference between Jew and Gentile. A world in which each party made sure that difference remained firm. One new man. No longer two. Christ is the one who makes peace between people. He is that foundation for peace. To impose laws or training programs or to offer funding will not bring about peace in this world. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to alleviate the distresses of this world. Let me be clear. But our hope cannot be in those things alone. It is Christ who is our peace. But it's not just that Christ brings peace between people. And as I said, the religious divide is the greatest divide that can exist between people, which means that our greater attention to the racial divide is to our shame. But it is not just the divide between people for which Christ gives peace. It is the divide between people and God. In verse 16, he goes on to say that Christ has made peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He might reconcile us both to God through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. You see, the hostility is not just between people, between Jew or Gentile, between black or white, whatever the, the hostility is not just there. The hostility is also against God. The Bible teaches us that every sin that you might commit against one another is first and foremost a sin against God. And that must be recognized. And Christ died at the cross in order to reconcile us to God, not just individually, a Jew here, a Gentile there, but as one body. One new man, one new people, the people of God. We now, who were distant from God, have been brought near to God. You see, even the Jews, in one sense, were far from God, though they didn't know it. Because they were trusting not the Lord their God, who is their peace, they were trusting their Jewishness. They were trusting their rituals. Oh, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They had the temple. They thought that was going to save them. God showed them. He took away the temple because their hearts were not his. Their hearts were far from him.
But God used Christ to reconcile us in one new man. Something totally new, like that gold statue. Something that didn't exist before. He reconciled us to God. And if it encompassed the one new man, encompassed the Jew-Gentile distinction, it certainly encompasses all other divisions, racial, economic, whatever they may be. You see, he just doesn't do it for you personally. He does it for his people. He's making a people. Remember the Apostle John, he says, how can you say that you love God when you, that you can't see when you don't love your brother who you do see? And we boast about our love for God when we can't get along with our fellow brother in Christ. No, Jesus, you see, is the one we have to keep looking to. Jesus at the cross, that's what he had to do in order to bring us together, but also in order to bring us to God. As he goes on to say in verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. Well, when did he preach peace? Well, it, it seems like it was after the crucifixion because he referred to the cross in verse 16. But you might remember, or maybe you don't, but what was the first word when Jesus appeared in the midst of his disciples in the locked room after his resurrection? He said, peace be with you. And then what did he do? he sent out his disciples with the message of God's kingdom, of God's peace, because of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Christ brings peace, not just between people, but between people and God. Indeed, between the people of God and God. Because you can't have peace without God without being part of the people of God. We are baptized into his body, Paul tells us elsewhere. One body. Lots of different parts. But our differences don't make us divided. Our differences show how much we need one another. Because none of us is all that we can or should be before the Lord. You see, only together, as God's people, will we find peace with God. Remember, on the night before he died, Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples. How will anyone know that we are a true believer, that you have love for one another? And what does he say here in verse 18? For through him, through Jesus, we both, again, looking at Jew and Gentile, the key division in that day and age, for in Christ, through him, we both have access in one spirit to God. Now that word access is a word that points to, the, to a king and his throne room. Remember in Esther, when Mordecai begged her to appeal to her husband, the king, to call off the order to destroy all the Jews. She said, I just can't walk in there and know that I'll be hurt. If he doesn't extend the scepter to me, I'll be killed automatically. There's no free access to the king. But through Christ, we both have access. But notice how we have access by one spirit. One spirit. There's not a spirit for you and a spirit for me. There's not a Jewish spirit and a Gentile spirit, a black spirit and a white spirit. There is one Holy Spirit. God is one. 
There's one Holy Spirit. God's people are one, both together. And the whole Trinity is wrapped up and determined to make it happen. Notice, through him, that is Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And when we have access together with one another in one spirit to the Father because of what Christ has done, then we will know real peace. That's a peace that can't be taken away from the world. When Christ gives you peace, you have peace indeed. The disciples were on the boat and it looked to them like the whole world was falling apart. Jesus, don't you care? Peace, be still. In Christ, when Christ is with you, when you are in Christ, there is peace. Now, we still struggle with ongoing remnants from sin. That's true. But those are things we need to repent of. But we are meant to be a picture to the world of what God's peace is all about. But that peace comes not by programs, but by Christ. Now, because of what Christ has done for us and in us and through us, it may move us to reach out in kindness and peace to others, to help those who are hurting, to encourage those who are being wrongly marginalized. But the answer is not in the programs. The answer is not in better education. The answer is not in twisting arms. The answer is to be found only in Christ. Christ on the cross, suffering and dying. It begins with Christ, it ends with Christ. But running throughout is a word of peace because of what Christ has done for us who believe. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world you will have trouble, but behold, I have overcome the world. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. May God so work in our hearts that we know that peace, that our lives are truly founded upon Christ, that we truly are joined to him because we have been saved by him. And may that peace we have from Christ extend through us and beyond us to those who are different from us. It's only Jesus that can bring real peace. But the world will only know that peace when they see it in us who believe. If you want peace, you must find it in Jesus. But we who claim Jesus much must show that we really do own that peace. Let's pray.